quarterly nothing personal word of the day. It is Wednesday, February 9th, 2022. And the word of the day is quarterly, as in Major League Baseball owners having quarterly meetings. That means that four times a year, quarterly, the owners get together in a different place, often in the wintertime, which is the January, February meetings. It's in Florida. You know, it used to be in Arizona because that's where the commissioner at the time had a home. Now it's in Florida because that's where this commissioner, Rod Manford, has a second home. And owners don't mind going to where it's warm, except the owners on the West Coast. Do you know, detour already, Coca, do you know how political it is where the owners' meetings are? Because owners don't like having to travel, so they'd prefer to have them where they are. So you keep track of where owners spend their time. And there's a bunch of owners on the West Coast, a bunch of owners on the East Coast. You have some owners who have a second home in Arizona, some who have a second home in Florida, some who don't have a second home. They're just in Texas. And so there's actually a system where they plan where the owners meetings are going to be. And we hosted one in Miami once in uh, at the Biltmore, which is in Coral Gables. And they have to come and they scout out the hotel and where all the breakout rooms are going to be. And they have to look at the suites where the commissioner is going to be. And then where certain owners, because they have certain requests for certain types of suites. And then you have to plan a meal because there's one meal the night before the big meeting. And then how far is it from the airport? It's a whole Megillah. There is a department in baseball called the special events department, and they plan the world series and they plan the all-star game and they plan international games and special events, field of dreams, Fort Bragg, anytime there's something out of the ordinary. But one of the things they also do is owners meetings. So when you go into a big owners meeting, all 30 teams are there and there's actually a system as to where teams are placed. Are they in the front row? Are they in the back row? They keep track of where teams have always sat in the past so they don't sit them near the teams they've been in the past. If they've been in the back row, then they start moving to the front row. If they've been next to the Yankees, then the next time they're next to the Royals. It's a whole thing. So right now they're in Orlando at the, I don't know where, probably a Ritz-Carlton. It's got to be a five-star. Wait a minute, the Ritz-Carlton in Orlando. Is that... That, that may be the hotel where Bob Saget passed away. So they may be in the Waldorf Astoria in Orlando. Either way, they choose a nice hotel in a city. The owners come. They bring their president. Some teams bring their GMs, but not many. You need a special dispensation to bring your president of baseball operations. Some meetings, baseball wants the baseball people to be there because they're going to be talking about rules or different things with player development where they want input from the president of baseball operations. Not all owners show up because some owners are away, even though they get noticed two years in advance. There's some owners, George Steinbrenner in my 18 years, he was at the meeting to extend Bud Selig. And that may be it. I may have seen him at one owner's meeting. Peter Angelos has stopped going to owner's meetings 10 years ago, I would say. I'd read that Steve Cohn is not going to be at this owner's meeting, but this is a big one because while they're quarterly, the winter meeting is all about spring training that's about to start. They show a pump up video with some of the great advertising theories and 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 programs they're going to have going forward but this year the quarterly meetings in orlando are all about collective bargaining so i want to tell you exactly what happens people come in on a tuesday media knows where the owners meetings are because they're told they go to the owners meeting and in the hotel when you walk in there are places where the media stands and there are certain writers whether they work for sports business journal or work for the associated press some of the local teams send their beat writers. So the media is there. You go to check in and you get a envelope. And inside the envelope, it has your name on it. So it would be David Sampson, Miami Marlins. And you open it up and you see several pieces of paper. Dear David, welcome to the January 2022, the February 2022 Major League Baseball quarterly owners meetings. 
And then you have an itinerary where you have to be for dinner, where you have to be for your committee meetings, because all committees meet during owners meetings. Remember, there's an international committee, there's a diversity committee, there's a strategic planning committee, there's a rules committee, there's the executive council, there's the labor committee, there's a committee to look at the committees. And then you take a look, you know where you have to be. You go to your room, waiting for you in your room, the TV is on. And one of the rules in order to host an owner's meeting is the hotel has to have MLB network. And if they don't have it, they have to get it. So you get up in your room and the TV's on. Now the remote control's inside a plastic condom. But either way, you get into your room, MLB network is on TV, and there's always some sort of present waiting for you, whether it's fruit and a cookie that has the MLB logo on it, or it's a little bottle of wine that has the MLB logo on it. There's something that says, hey, you are really important. You wonder why it's so hard to leave baseball because you're told so many times at so many meetings how important it is and that the focus of the world is on these meetings. And you think that because there's media everywhere and there's a lot of buzz and it's on Sports Center, and CBS is covering it and nothing personal is covering it. And then I would call my friends who had nothing to do with baseball and they'd say, hey, where are you? And I would say, hey, I'm at an owner's meeting. And they'd say, oh, didn't know that was happening. It's always good when you think you're really, when, you're, when your self-importance is growing to a level previously unknown and you call people and they say, what do you, what do you, I don't even know what you're talking about. You didn't hear about the fight that's go, that happened on the field in the clubhouse. You didn't hear about this guy who got fired. You didn't hear about that trade. No, I have no idea. It's always important in your business to have, if possible, somebody who you're close to who can give you a frame of reference. We talk a lot about having surrounding yourself with psychophants and surrounding yourself with yes people and people who genuflect in your general direction. It's so important to have people who bring you down to earth. But anyway, so you go to the owner's meeting and this one is especially concerning. And the reason why this is concerning is we're all waiting for Moses to come off the mountain. I give you these 15 commandments. <sighs> 10. Coca, do you have any idea what that is? Can we stop the show and just, can you tell me if you understand that movie reference? Is there any chance you're even with me? I cannot hear you right now. Did we lose connection? Hello? I give you these 15 commandments and one of the tablets falls and then it's 10 commandments. Do you have any idea what that is? Yes. Mel Brooks, history of the world part. Either one or two. I can't remember the name of the movie. I think it's history of the world part two. So coming out of this meeting, it is expected and people are writing about it. I think Commissioner Manford is going to have to tell people that spring training is not going to start on time. And in related news, tomorrow is Thursday. Folks, spring training is not going to start on time. And do you know how much discussion the owners are having about that fact this week in Orlando? Donata, zero. Everything that you think they're discussing, they're not. Oh, they're going to meet right now and they're coming up with a counter proposal and they're going to come out of this meeting. White smoke is going to billow out of the vents at the Orlando five star hotel, which Coke hasn't told me whether or not it's Four Seasons or Waldorf Astoria. And out will come a counter offer, which the players have been waiting for and complaining about because, oh, no. There's been no counter offer to the latest offer that the players gave, which was a response to an offer that the owners gave. It's called back and forth. And then yesterday, coincidentally, not, there was a release, not a statement, but a some sort of leaked release by someone on the player's side. They've got all these players doing interviews and doing tweets. They had uh, the Kansas City Royals representative, a great player named Whit Merrifield. He did a podcast with Jason Stark and Doug Glanville, where he was able to get his messages out. That's all pre-planned by the union. It's not Whit wakes up and says, hey, I want to go on Jason's podcast. It's not how it works. And he was talking about the fact that they're not making us any offers. And by the way, there's a provision in the law. And I don't, I'm not talking about the baseball rules. 
I'm talking about the actual law, which says that management has to negotiate. And they're not negotiating, which means they're going to be in violation of the National Labor Relations Act, which could seriously jeopardize their legal position. Guess what? Do you think the lawyers in Major League Baseball, because they've got outside lawyers, very often it was Proskow Rose, the same law firm we used in New York. There was a labor lawyer named Howard Gans who would always be at the owner's meetings when we were negotiating collective bargaining because he would be there to make sure that we're not running afoul of any of the rules of negotiating. And Proskauer would be used to help Dan Hallam, who is the deputy commissioner in charge of negotiations. He comes from Proskauer as well. Proskauer is the firm that we used for corporate law for the Marlins. So do you think that they don't have the lawyers telling them exactly what they need to do, how they need to do it, and when they need to do it. Give me a break. Of course they do. The owners will never do anything. Never say never. Never do anything that will put them in any sort of jeopardy of violating any sort of labor law. It's not going to happen. So all of this that the players are trying to tell you is to sway you for the players against the owners. I get it. But owners don't sit there during these meetings saying, man, these players are getting the best of us. We really need to figure something out. There are PR people in baseball who worry about that. But the owners don't think about it. The owners are interested in winning this collective bargaining negotiation. They are interested in giving up as little as possible to the players, paying them as little as possible in order to maximize their profit. That's what they talk about. The other thing that goes on during these owners' meetings is unbelievable shuttle diplomacy. Yesterday, we started the show with a segment about streaming and the Cubs and their streaming network. And I explained to you that there is more underneath the surface. It's like an iceberg. There's a lot more going on below the surface than just the Cubs starting a streaming network with their broadcast partner. This is about high revenue and low revenue owners beginning to clash. Shuttle diplomacy is what the commissioner and the deputy commissioner and other people in the commissioner's office in the labor relations department do to see where individual owners are in terms of different provisions of the collective bargaining agreement and what they're willing to vote yes on and what they are an absolute no on, whether or not they are willing to continue the lockout, whether or not they're willing to miss any games, how many games, what their capital structure is, what their debt structure is. What, how much money is in the piggy bank saved for a rainy day? What impact it has on TV deals, on sponsorship deals? What impact it has on contracts of players? All of that is going on, but not during any particular meeting. The most important thing that happens at quarterly meetings, and which is why I would never be in my room, is that if you're around, you're in the loop. You go to the bar and there's different people at different places and you sort of move in and out of small market contingencies and large market caucuses. You attach yourself to certain owners to say, hey, what's your view of this? I would spend a lot of time with Stu Sternberg because I needed him, Tampa specifically, to be aligned with Florida as we were having discussion points about revenue sharing or about debt ceilings, the debt service rule, and other rules that exist that can be very difficult for teams without a lot of revenue to not be in violation of. So the better members of the media recognize that to get the best stories, you don't necessarily write and pay attention to what is being said by the commissioner in his press conference at the end of the meeting. You get people to speak on background and to speak off the record about real things that are going on behind the scenes. So we saw an article that said, we see the meeting room where the Labor Relations Committee is meeting, and that committee is made up of Ron Fowler of the San Diego Padres and chaired by Dick Monford of the Colorado Rockies, and it has John Henry of the Boston Red Sox and Jim Polat of the Minnesota Twins and Hal Steinbrenner of the New York Yankees, and this is the Lin-Manuel Miranda room where it happens. No, it's not. 
What goes on in the labor policy committee meetings is they are coming up with what they want to do, but they don't do it without speaking to the rest of the teams because, you know, by watching nothing personal, you need 23 votes. The labor policy committee can pretend they're the coolest people on earth. They can negotiate with the players. They can come up with an agreement that they love, that they think is fair. And if they don't get 23 yes votes, they might as well be voting on whether or not quarter pounders are better than whoppers. So all of the diplomacy going on behind the scenes, all of the conversations where they're talking about where are you on minimum salary? As part of this deal, we're going to have to go to 725,000. And we've looked at your payroll. This is what the people in the Labor Department do at Major League Baseball. We, because they have all 30 teams' payrolls. They keep track of 30 teams' payrolls. By the way, side note, when Rob Manford or anybody in the commissioner's office tells you in the media the way Rob told Dan Lebetard that he wasn't commenting or didn't know whether or not the Marlins were going to trade Giancarlo Stanton, that's a bunch of horse hockey. They've got the payrolls of every team. They've got the players on every team. They speak to the owners on every team, and they know the player moves that are going to be made because they know where the payrolls have to end up. Because as teams, we have to submit what our payroll is going to be to Major League Baseball. And we hated doing that. And the reason we hated doing that is we were worried about leaks from the commissioner's office to other teams where other teams would then know what our payroll had to be. So they would then take advantage of the fact that we had to shed salary or the fact that we were willing to actually take on salary. So every team has their own agenda. And it's the commissioner's job to get 23 team agendas to align. And that's what you're seeing. Look for the commissioner to meet the media tomorrow. We'll discuss it on Friday's show. When he meets the media, he will announce to you that spring training is delayed. He will announce to you with bags under his eyes, with a feeling of resignation yet strength, that they are sitting at the table. They stand ready to negotiate a fair and equitable deal and that they are going to continue to work hard until a deal is done. Take a look at that. Now, what are the Dodgers doing at this owner's meeting? They're always a big part of the owner's meeting because they're a bunch of financial bullies. So, Coca, I think we should answer someone's question about the Dodgers. You know what I want? <laughs> I want to talk to Samson. So you want to talk to Samson. Get into my Twitter at David P. Samson, if you don't mind. Hit follow and then ask a question. I'm having a hard time, Coca. I got to work through the whole blue thing. I don't know if you know, uh, if you're not on Twitter, you may not, but my direct messages are open on David P. Sampson. And blue is when you haven't read a DM. White is when you, it turns white when you've read it. Anyway, so I've way too many blues and I'm sorry about that, but I get to as many as I can. Here's the question. And there was no, hello, David. I usually prefer hello, David, or hey, what's up, what's shaking? Now that there will not be criminal charges against Trevor Bauer, would you expect that Bauer will be back in uniform pitching for the Dodgers in 2022? Hey, hey, thanks for asking. Here's a hint. You have a better chance of getting your question on a show immediately if you ask a question about a topic that you're pretty sure I'm going to be discussing anyway. Just a little hint for everyone listening. Trevor Bauer released a six minute and 50 second video on YouTube yesterday called The Truth. Word came out of Pasadena that the Pasadena District Attorney's Office has decided that they will not be pursuing legal criminal charges against Trevor Bauer. Oh my God, that means Trevor Bauer is innocent. That means Trevor Bauer did not hit a woman, did not choke a woman out, did not punch her in her Face did not punch her in her vagina, did not do anything. It was consensual rough sex, done, end of story, all good. She's a total liar, and that's it. Oh, sorry, I was just recapping Trevor Bauer's six-minute video. When a district attorney does not go forward with pressing charges, it only means one thing. They do not believe they've got the witnesses who will be able to convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the crimes that he will or she will or they will have been charged with. That's all it means. Because there's one thing district attorneys don't like. They don't like losing. And if you don't press charges against someone, you can't get an acquittal, which means you haven't lost. 
All it means is they don't believe they can get a conviction. Okay. So Trevor Bauer gets on the video. But what do you do if you're the Dodgers? So let me remind you the contract that Trevor Bauer signed. He signed a two-year deal plus an option year, player option for a third year. He's making $40 million the first year, $40 million the second year, $15 million the third year, or a little more. I think it was like $105 million guaranteed over three years. It was this brilliant contract that the Dodgers signed. They were so excited because they've got the money to pay that huge amount of money on an individual annual basis without going long-term with Andrew, which Andrew Friedman does not like to do. He's the president of baseball operations for the Dodgers. Win-win deal. Even though Trevor Bauer, there were certainly signs of Trevor Bauer that he would not be perfect in the clubhouse with what he did in Cleveland, how outspoken he is. But the Dodgers said, hey, we're trying to defend our championship. Okay. Trevor Bauer gets put on administrative leave when word comes out that he had an issue that could involve domestic violence with a woman. Trevor Bauer's administrative leave lasted from July through the end of the postseason. He didn't pitch at all, but, 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 but he got paid by the Dodgers last year not to pitch. The Dodgers are the number one team who love paying players not to play because they can afford it. They are perfectly fine. They're happy to pay salaries of players playing for other teams. They're happy to pay salaries of players who've been released. They're happy to pay salaries of players who were signed to be in the big leagues, but suck so badly, they go to the minor leagues. No problem. But what the Dodgers also did last year is they canceled his bobblehead promotion. They pulled all merchandise out of the team stores. They basically pretended they hadn't signed Trevor Bauer. Well, now Trevor Bauer is not going to be charged. Do they take him back? Do they start restocking the shelves when they're coming up with their rotation on their board as they get ready for spring training, whenever that shall be? Do they just say, hey, we're slatting him Bauer? We lost Scherzer. We might as well have Bauer in there as our number one. Well, number two behind Walker Bueller. Well, maybe number three behind Urias. Ooh, maybe number four if they happen to re-sign Clayton Kershaw. But either way, we need Bauer. Nope. Trevor Bauer will never wear a Dodgers uniform again. The Los Angeles Dodgers are the team that can easily release him, pay him his money, but they are going to fight this. So once word came out that Pasadena was not pressing charges, the next thing that happened is the media called Rob Manford and said, hey, are you going to suspend him now? Are you going to finish your investigation? Because baseball had been waiting for the criminal investigation to be complete before completing their own investigation. News flash alert. It doesn't matter whether Trevor Bauer was accused of a crime because that is not the criteria for the commissioner having the ability to suspend a player. You don't need a conviction. You don't need to be charged. It can simply be the commissioner saying there is enough evidence from his own investigation where he believes a suspension is warranted. But the tricky part of this story is that there's a collective bargain agreement going on. And the tricky part is that if the commissioner suspends Trevor Bauer, Trevor Bauer is going to file a grievance. But you know from watching nothing personal that players actually don't get to file grievances. It's the union that files the grievance on behalf of the player. So the player goes to the union and says, I'm angry. I want my day before an arbitrator file a grievance on my behalf. And the union, 99.99% of the time says, damn, Skippy, we are filing that grievance. There are grievances that are numbered by year. So the first grievance of 2022 would be 2022-1. But during a collective bargaining negotiation, one of the things that happens right at the end of the negotiation is that all pending grievances are settled as part of the new collective bargaining agreement. Do you remember that big grievance that's going on between the players and the owners? Because the players are claiming the owners could have played more than 60 games in 2020 with COVID, and they had a duty to play more than 60 games. And they're claiming that the commissioner lollygagged around with the owners to make it so they could only play 60 games. 
but the players said, why don't we play in November? And the owners said that broadcast networks don't want us to play in November. The weather's not good in November, so we can only afford, and there's only time for 60 games. And the owners are now in a grievance with the players. That grievance, I told you, will never see the light of day because it's going to be settled as part of this collective bargain agreement. So right now, the commissioner has to weigh whether or not he suspends Trevor Bauer now and then allows the union to file the grievance and then settles that grievance as part of collective bargaining. Or the other alternative is the commissioner's office goes to the union and says, hey, this is what we're thinking about Bauer. Go talk to him and see if we can settle this right now at game served. That's what they did with Marcelo Zuna, as you recall. Marcelo Zuna was suspended for 20 games, but he got credit for the 20 games. He missed way more than that on administrative leave. So they could suspend Trevor Bauer for 100 games and say he's already served. How many games did he miss, Coca? There's no way he's going to find out that this quickly, and he had no way of knowing I was even going to talk about this. So how could I expect Coca when it's just the two of us, Grover Washington Jr., just the two of us? We can make it if we try. God, we could use some help here, Coca. CBS, are you listening? Can someone tell me how many games Trevor Bauer missed? Nah, it's just us. But they could suspend Trevor Bauer for the number of games he missed and say that's our suspension, but time served. Then he is a member of the Dodgers. Then the commissioner has to go to the Dodgers and say, hey, I understand you wanted him suspended for a year, but we're not going to do that. We're going to suspend him, but he's really eligible to be back on your roster. So you've got a choice. You can trade him, you can release him, or you can play him. So the way this is going to play out is that he's not going to be traded because no one's trading for him. He's not going to pitch for the Dodgers because there's no way the Dodgers are going to go back when the clubhouse doesn't even want Trevor Bauer there, meaning the players. The fans, no matter whether Pasadena filed criminal charges or not, the fans want no part of Trevor Bauer. They're just going to suck it up and pay that man his money. Okay, there's another thing going on in baseball. This is heavy baseball before the break here, Coca. Although we may have been interrupted seven times on YouTube. You getting that revenue, CBS? There is another situation going on. Do you remember the Tyler Skaggs story? Tyler Skaggs is the player who overdosed the pitcher for the Angels on a game day. And he ended up choking on his own vomit. And he was an opioid potential addict. We don't know, but he had opioids in his system, et cetera. And Eric K., an employee of the Angels, is being charged criminally. And that trial is going on right now. Well, something happened in that trial. The way trials happen is before they start, there's an opening statement by both the prosecution and the defense. The prosecution are district attorneys who represent the state. And the defense are lawyers hired by the defendant. Opening statements happen when the jury comes in. They sit down. First, you put a jury together. It's called voir dire. You, the jury sits. And then opening statements come. What opening statements are is where you lay out. It's like when you write a research paper when you're back in high school or college or a term paper. Your introduction, that's what an opening statement is. Here's what we are going to do for the next 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, you will realize that there is no evidence to support that Eric K caused the death of Tyler Skaggs. And even if there were evidence, there is no way to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the actions of Eric K led to the death of Tyler Skaggs. The prosecution will say in the next 10 days, we are going to show witness after witness about what Eric K was doing, the drug ring that he was running, and that him giving Tyler Skaggs drugs beyond a reasonable doubt is what caused his death. But the defense did something different. In their opening statement, they actually came out and said, we're also going to call as a witness someone named Matt Harvey. You may know him as Batman, or you may know him as a pitcher who was supposed to be great, ended up being mediocre at best. And we're going to show that Matt Harvey may have given Tyler Skaggs drugs and not Eric Kay. 
or it was Matt Harvey in addition to Eric K or it was Matt Harvey in addition to John Doe, Jane Doe and Howard Doe, Howard the Duck. Why is the defense trying to say that Matt Harvey had something to do with it? People are under the impression now, oh, my God, is Matt Harvey going to be charged? Is he a criminal? Did he murder Tyler Skaggs? Is he responsible for the death? That is not what the defense is saying. The defense is trying to get the jury to believe that there is a possibility, a reasonable doubt that Eric K. was solely responsible. That is the threshold in a criminal case. You've heard these words. You've watched Law & Order. Beyond a reasonable doubt. I've never watched Law & Order, so I don't know if it's on Law & Order. But maybe L.A. Law. Have you heard that one? I bet Coke has no idea what L.A. Law is. Beyond a reasonable doubt. That means when the jury sits in the jury room. Have you ever served on a jury? Side note, Coca, I was on a jury. Oh, my God, I got to tell the story of the jury. Have I ever told the story of when I was the foreman of a jury and I actually acquitted a guy for a drug deal and then I saw him after? I probably told you that story. Is that right, Coca? I don't want to retell a story. You can tell me after because you're ignoring me right now. And that's fine because you're focused on big news coming out of Washington again because you're yelling in my ear about Dan Snyder while I'm talking about Tyler Skaggs. Don't try this at home. Anyway. I have a wait to see. Wait to see is when I tell you something's going to happen. If it happens, I'll revisit it. If it doesn't, I'll revisit it because Coca keeps track. Eric K is going to get acquitted. It is going to be very difficult. No, no, no. Four, eight, 69. Wait to see. Eric K will be acquitted because it is going to be impossible for the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Eric Kay was responsible for the tragic death of Tyler Skaggs. It's not going to bring Tyler Skaggs back. It is a major story in baseball with what goes on in these clubhouses, with the amount of drugs that are flowing back and forth, the amount of painkillers, the amount of opioids. It is rampant. Don't kid yourself. Tyler Skaggs is not the only guy taking opioids in baseball. But Eric Kay will be acquitted. Wait to see. All right, when we come back, we're going to review one of the Oscar nominees because every day now I'm going to watch an Oscar nominee that I haven't seen. I watched a documentary called Attica, and then we're going to get to how angry I am that we only split the pick of the day last night. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It's David Sampson. Thank you for making it through the gauntlet of commercials. Thank you for going on YouTube, Nothing Personal with David Sampson. Please hit subscribe. For whatever reason, we cannot get to 10,000 subscribers. We're trying to get to 100,000 to a million subscribers because Coca wants us to turn into McAfee because he wants to get paid. He wants to have like extra bedrooms that he won't use. Well, he may use, but we can talk about that later. So thank you for telling your friends about Nothing Personal because you're doing it. Coca calls me every day with the numbers because we are a numbers op outfit here and we want to know and we know. People are watching and listening, and we thank you. So documentary feature nominated best Attica. If you were born in 1990, like Matthew Coca, you would have no idea what Attica is. Is that possible? Attica is a maximum correctional facility in the state of New York. And in 1971, there was a riot in Attica where the prisoners, mostly black, took over the prison and took guards, mostly white, hostage. This was a huge story. Spoiler alert, a lot of people died. Somehow this documentary got a bunch of people who were there at the time, a bunch of the former prisoners, to give you insight into what was going on in Attica, the mistreatment that was happening, the problem, and this is 51 years ago. People realize that racial reckoning is happening. Racism is, maybe we're making progress. The racism that existed back in the 70s, as you know, I guess same as the 2020s. It's significant. Unreasonable to have all white guards with all black, and I say all black, mostly black inmates. There may have been some people of color who were guards, but at the end of the day, the way these inmates were treated was 
looked like they were animals. And eventually the inmates said, we've had enough. And they tried to, in a very nonviolent way, effectuate change. Now, I agree taking over a prison and holding hostages is not really the way to get it done, except when you have no other choice, that's the feeling they had because what are the qualities that make people the most dangerous? If you had a guess, I think it's a pretty easy one, right? When people feel they have nothing to lose, when you feel that way, you tend to alter your behavior to reflect that feeling. And there's nothing scarier than people who have nothing to lose because that means they feel they have nothing to gain. And that means that there's no consequence for their actions. And you know that in my world, actions have consequences, but that's my privileged world. There are people out there whose actions don't have consequences because what more can you do? And they said this during the documentary. What are you going to do? Put me in solitary? What are you going to do? Feed me crappy food? Have conditions that are horrible? It can't be worse. This is a documentary with footage that I'd never seen before. Fascinating and well worthy of its Academy Award nomination. Please take the time and watch a documentary called Attica. Okay, nothing personal word of the day. That's not what it is, Coca. Can we wipe that? Okay, I'll count us in. 542.69. Nothing personal pick of the day. Why did I go with two games yesterday? But I did. Did you like the Celtics minus six over the Nets? Do you like the fact that the Nets have lost nine in a row and that was the easiest pick of all time? The Celtics won by 97 points. That brought us to 19 and 13. But I got greedy because we've been so hot that for whatever reason, we took the Lakers. The Lakers were getting four and a half from the Milwaukee Bucks and the Milwaukee Bucks crushed them. I think Giannis shot 41 for 41 and scored 117 points. Russell Westbrook got benched again in the third quarter and the Lakers absolutely stink. I thought that there may have been a turnaround with that Nick game and that they would come and compete with the Bucs, that they'd be motivated to compete with the Bucs. But the Bucs are just better. But that was not even the most interesting part. Now, let me quickly finish the nothing personal pick of the day before I talk about what I'm going to talk about. So now we're 19 and 14, having lost the Lakers game. The trade deadline is tomorrow. Tomorrow's a big day in sports, Coca. We have the NBA trade deadline. So we're going to see whether or not James Harden gets traded. No. We're going to see whether or not Bradley Beal gets traded. No, he's out for the season. We're going to see whether or not the Lakers trade Russell Westbrook. Good luck with that. We're going to see who, stop, who stays pat, who's tanking, who's not, who gives up. Pacers, Kings. God, the Kings got totally royally screwed in that trade, didn't they? Anyway, let's talk about the pick today. Right before the trade deadline, players get anxious. They're worried, am I going to be a salary cap throw into a trade to make the money even? Am I going to have to find new school? Am I going to have to pack my bags and stay in a hotel for two weeks? Where is this team playing? Where am I flying to? Where am I now? There is tension that happens before a trade deadline. The Cavs play the Spurs tonight. The Cavs did something. They made a trade to make their team better. The Cavs, the lowly Cavs, the post-LeBron, we can't win a game Cavs are a powerhouse. That's not true. They're not a powerhouse. They are a very good team in the Eastern Conference. They're giving seven points to the Spurs. That is way too many for a Greg Popovich-led team, one of the top 15 coaches. By the way, the list of top 15 coaches came out in NBA history, and my mentor, Red Holzman, is one of them, as he should be, coach of the Knicks in 1970 and 1973. Current coaches, Eric Spolstra, top 15. Doc Rivers, a current coach, top 15. Pat Riley, Phil Jackson, Casey Jones. Red Arback, of course. Anyway, Greg Popovich is a top 15 coach, but this is the worst team that he has coached. Cavs minus seven over Spurs. Easy peasy. That's our pick of the day. All right, let's go back to the Lakers. Because LeBron James was so angry after last night's loss that he immediately, in the post-game news conference, he sat there with Antonio Davis. That's not who he sat there with. He sat there with Anthony Davis. 
How many times have I made that mistake in 536 regular episodes of Nothing Personal? Just curious. 20? It's ridiculous. He sat there and he gave a very honest appraisal of the Los Angeles Lakers. He said, we're not good. He said, I knew before the game even started, by the way, wouldn't it have been nice if he had said something to those of us who had chosen the Lakers and nothing personal pick of the day? Wouldn't that be a little inside info that we'd like to get? A little nugget where you do your pregame media meet and you say, man, we can't compete with this team. The minute you say that, you're done. So LeBron said that we're just not as good as the Bucs. Don't belong in the same court as they do. What are they going to do? Their general manager, Rob Palenka, it's rumored, is going to work with LeBron James to make the changes necessary because they do not want to throw away this season with LeBron having one of his best seasons, believe it or not, but also getting up there in age at 37, trying to hang on to eventually play with Bronny, which can't happen for a couple of years, but he wants another title. What do you do when the player who you empowered to make the player moves halfway through the next season says the player moves weren't good? We're not good. Do you go back to that player and say, hey, what do you want to do now? You stop giving power to the players to make personnel moves. I don't care if your name is LeBron James. It makes no difference. He has proven time and time again that he'd rather have his guys than a winning team. Coca, in preparing for the show, said to me, he said, David, you're totally wrong. He and Westbrook aren't friends. He wanted Westbrook on the team because that was a trade they could do. The Wizards wanted to get rid of him. And he thought that Westbrook, combining with Davis and James, would make a team along with their best friend, Carmelo Anthony, and that would be a championship caliber team. And I said, Coco, whether he thought they were friends, whether they hang out or hang out off the court or on the court, that's not relevant to me. What's relevant is that LeBron is the one who gave the go-ahead for the transaction. For the Lakers to succeed, they have to take the player development and the player decision-making away. So what do you do now if you're the Lakers? Because if you trade Russell Westbrook, I don't know how you're going to find someone to take him, but if you do, do you then go public and say, hey, I was wrong if you're LeBron James? Or do you say, hey, this team wasn't put together in the right way, and I already told you I had nothing to do with it. But then your GM is on record to say he's going to consult you again the way he consulted you during the offseason. Which means that right now, Rob Palink of the Lakers has to be talking to LeBron James, not just about player moves, believe it or not. They also have to talk about how they're going to position these player moves. Who is going to take the loss? in the fact that the team they put together is so poorly put together that they cannot win games and they're languishing below 500 in danger of not just being in the play-in tournament, but not even making the play-in tournament. Although there's no way the Kings are going to catch them. But the Pelicans, I guess, could. Wait, Coca, what are the current standings? Is there a chance? How many games are the Lakers away from actually not making the playoffs? Is that really something that's possible? I would like to know that. Because on top of everything, when you have to worry about dealing with your players during the trade deadline or during the offseason, it means you can't do your job the best way possible. That's why I didn't really like consulting with players. Now, I had plenty of time in the day when I would talk to the players about what we were doing, and I would listen to the players with what they wanted done, but I would make it very clear to the players that we are going to make the decisions that we think are best. The Lakers right now are five games up in the loss column on the Trailblazers who just traded C.J. McCollum, so they're not going to win this year. So the Lakers are in the nine spot. They are ahead of the Pelicans who are at the 10 spot. Did you see that picture of the Pelicans? They traded for McCollum, Coca? People were wondering what I was talking about on Twitter. I have to explain it. So a, a trade was made where a big score went to the Pelicans and they released a picture the Pelicans did of Zion Williamson and CJ McCollum and another player who I don't remember who standing there in a Pelicans uniform, like, here we come. 
Meanwhile, Zion Williamson hasn't played one game for the Pelicans this year. Meanwhile, Zion Williams weighs about three bills at the moment. And they photoshopped him to look fit. Do you think that that happens just because the PR department and the arts department just does something? I got a surprise for you, Coca. That comes from the top. You don't release a Photoshop through your PR department of your number one pick who hasn't played a game and you make him sculpted like Adonis without getting permission from the very top. But they went so far as to be beyond credibility. Check out that picture if you can. All right, quickly back to the Lakers. The Lakers are saying they got to make moves. They got to get better. The problem is they've got no assets to move. Wait to see. The Los Angeles Lakers will not make a trade by tomorrow's deadline of consequence. But instead, LeBron James will come out and give another quote and comment before the next game, which says, we've got the right people here. We are going to get our act together and look out. We've got a championship caliber team to win our second title in three years. You wait to see. That's not an official wait to see. That's it, Coca. Hey, remember. It's just business. This is nothing personal. 